So welcome again, uh, everyone, uh, to EHESS and this uh, brand new Condorcet campus. Um, I must say it's not self-evident for a political scientist uh, that I am to host uh, such a workshop on the literary and cultural uh, uh, histories of uh, the Nordic uh, regions, uh, but it's part of the bridge-building effort that we make uh, together with uh, Daniel, uh, who is uh, a guest uh, at EHSS uh, this winter, and, uh, and I find it very, very stimulating. At least we have one common meeting point somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, because we both did a little something on Iceland at some point. Uh, Daniel <laughs> wrote a, a book about the Icelandic crisis. I, I made a, a little documentary film about the consequences of the political consequences of the crisis. Um, and uh, so today we will have a, a vast array of perspectives on uh, different uh, areas of the uh, Nordic hemisphere uh, and Nordic region. Uh, starting with uh, Malan uh, Manastotier from the University of the Ferrari. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Harry Veivo and Sylvain Briens for uh, taking part in the discussion and everyone for being here. And uh, we've decided uh, about the format to have all the, um, the, the five presentations in a row. Since we only have two hours, that will be... Uh, there will be a time constraint, so about 15 minutes per uh, speaker, uh, so that we uh, end up having some time for the final discussion. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, filmed and recorded uh, today. So please uh, speak in the mic. <laughs> and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to speak about this book of mine that just was published the other day at, in the Danish house here in Paris. I'm very f happy to do that. And it's, this is the res result of a cooperation with Daniel Chartier uh, uh, that started some f five, five years ago. Um, and it's a book about literature in the Faroe Islands. And I'm sorry for the... PowerPoint is in French, but there's not so much text in it that I, but I will repeat it in, 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 in try to repeat it in English. Um, you see, the Faroe Islands uh, are situated in the North Atlantic, and this one is, uh, uh, this part of the picture is a statement from the, the Republican Party that the Faroe Islands are not small, they are small as a territory, but they have a huge uh, uh, territory on the sea. So the Faroe Islands are not a small uh, country. It's two, 302,000 square kilometers. The land is only f 1,400 square kilometers. Uh, the book is uh, divided into four chapters. The first chapter is about the 19th century, when, uh, when the Faroese language was promoted as a literary language, the first book in Faroese was published in 1822 uh, by a Danish priest who, on his journey to the Faroe Islands to study seaweed, uh, came over the Faroese uh, dance ballads that he recognized that some, from something that he knew about uh, the Völsunga saga, uh, uh, figures from the Völsunga uh, saga, and also from the German Nibelungenlied. So he collected some examples from, or rather many examples from these uh, ballads and got them published in a book. Um, and that's the first time Ferry's text is published in a book. It's published in a uh, writing that is phonetic, because there was no Faroese uh, orto orthography at that time, uh, and it is uh, published in a, in a Danish environment. All the paratexts are in Danish. The foreword, the afterword, the notes, the, expl uh, the ex explanations, and the text is in Faroese on the one side, and the, on the right side of the open book, it is in Danish. And the, uh, my point is that 
There was one book with Ferrish text in 1822, and today there's about to be 200 books published each year. Uh, we have a, a good statistic that started in 1967 when there were five, 25 books published every year in uh, that year at least in Faroese. So uh, the the number of publications in Faroese have have um, increased very much in those 200 years, and it is exactly that it is exactly 200 years since this first book was published to celebrate this year. Uh, and that corresponds with the demograph demographic uh, um, development on the Faroe Islands. In 1822, there were about 5,000 people living in the Faroe Islands, and today we are 54,000. Uh, this is a very, very short uh, overview of the, the historical uh, points to... To, to uh, in 1814, the, the point is that in 1814 the Faroe Islands became Danish. Before that, there had been Norwegian, and that the peace in Kiel, uh, Norwegian was linked to Sweden, and uh, the, the the countries that belo used to belong to Norway became Danish at that point. But the main point is for the language and for the literature that everything written in the Faroe Islands was in Danish, just as it had been in Norway for, for centuries since the Reformation in the 16th century. Um, so, and it's only in the beginning of the uh, eight, 19th century that the idea comes up to, to if, if Faroese is a language on its own. And um, after this publication of this Faroese ballad, Faroese Kvela, uh, the construction of the Faroese orthography started, uh, started in 1846 and, and, and got its form that we use today in, in, uh, in the beginning of the 1850s. Um, but it wasn't used for, it, it didn't come into general use. It was a, a, a tool for the people who, um, who gathered, who, who wrote down the old, uh, Ballads, the old uh, chanson de geste, the, the old folk ballads for dance. Uh, in the end of the century, the first poems written about the uh, yeah contemporary poems were written in Copenhagen in 1876 by by students. They started to to describe the Faroese landscape in Faroese writing in in this writing that was. Uh, constructed in the 1840s. And that became the start of a Faroese literature in Faroese, describing the Faroese landscape. And that was also the first time that was done in liter literary terms. And then start, from here on starts Faroese literature to develop. Uh, and after the law of um, uh, home rule, in eight, after the Second World War, 1948, uh, the Faroese... Uh, tend to be the the only language of the country. That's the, what what uh, what they are striving for uh, to eliminate everything in Faroese that resembles Danish, in order to create a genuine Faroese language. And that was also the point of the of starting to to write poems. And in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we had the First, uh, the first half of the 20th century, uh, there were start, uh, starting to, to create an, an area or the, institu the literary institution in Faroese on the Faroe Islands. But there were, of course, the, a few authors that wrote in Danish, um, not intentionally in the beginning, but it became, it was an ambition to get known outside of the Faroe Islands and to describe the Faroe Islands in Danish. And that were uh, the most um, known poets or writers we have in the Faroe Islands, William Heinsen, who wrote uh, The Lost Musicians, uh, and uh, etc. And Jakob, uh, Jürgen Franz Jakobsen, who wrote Barbara. Um, but the main, the aim of the Faroe, the, Faroe, the poetry and the 
prose in Faroese was to create this Faroese literary language that should be genuine, not influenced by Danish. And that uh, in the second part of the 20th century, which is the third chapter of my book, um, uh, the, the literature follows the, the new order of the society with the home rule uh, to, to construct a various la- literature of the na- an autonomous uh, uh, a nation. The nation building continued. But now, after the Second World War, there came into the literature a, a, a new, way, new order. The, the, before the war, the novels were uh, describing the change from the old society, the agriculture language society, and the clash between fishery, the, the old uh, farming society, and the new uh, society based on fishing and produce production of fish products to, to sell to the international market. And after the war, then the literature started to... to write more about the inner problems of the modern society, how the, 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 the individual felt uh, alone, how the, the artist uh, strived to, to get uh, recognition and to find himself in this modern, in modernity. And in the fourth, uh, fourth chapter of my book, I, uh, I um, describe some the new... The, the, the themes that are uh, the authors are writing about now, and uh, some of them are of course gender. Uh, the before the Second World War, it was it were the men who were writing about how the nature the nation was to be built, how the the images of a Faroese nation. In, in nowadays, in the 21st century, it is, it is the women who are writing these novels about how uh, the Faroe Islands uh, quit with Denmark, or and another one, who, this other novel is written in Norwegian, how uh, the Faroese are not able to take the decision to be a sovereign country uh, because they can't take a decision, they can't uh, the politici- Faroese politicians can't make up their minds to, to make a plan for the secession. Uh, we have the, um, also um, uh, the, immigrants, the immigrants uh, are, tro- are starting to be part of Faroese literature. This Kalpana Via Varatan, she's, in, uh, she's from India, and she has published an, a, a volume of poetry that describes her her difficulties to get to get into the Faroe society and how how she um, yeah is met as an as an Indian woman and also also linguistically it's very interesting to see how she mixes uh, Faroese and English in an aesthetic and a creative way. Uh, we have uh, uh, crime crime fiction in Faroese that started in 1999 with Jekvan Isaksen. He has written 12 mystery novels, and he has just been uh, came out on a series uh, dis, uh, dispute, distribute, distributed by Viaplay called Trom, which means cut. It means uh, an edge, something you can fall down from. And otherwise, Faroese literature in this century is, as everywhere else. Uh, literature on, on ecology, ecology uh, issues. Um, the literature is in many ways also in, in, on this area in ecology, in, in, uh, concerning climate, climate changes and ecology, far ahead of the politicians, various politicians, they don't want to, to, to deal with the subject and they say, we are so small, we do, don't do any difference in the whole, whole, whole world. And that's, uh, of course, a, a statement that, that thinking people or uh, artists don't like. They are opposing to that. And we just, in, as, at the same time as my book was pop, uh, presented in the Danish House 
uh, on Monday, uh, this very fine poet, Louis Maria Roa de Jäger, presented her uh, poet, poems that are uh, about to be translated into French that will, will this, uh, be published later this year or next year. They are about to be published. Kim Simonson is a uh, uh, he has a, holds a PhD in literature, but he is also a poet that that uh, writes in this ecological um, area, and he has also written about some of the features that we have you have been speaking to this morning about how um, how the Faroese how Faroese literature in the 19th century and onwards has created this image of a Faroese nation, um, also based on research, uh, what's called it in English, Récit de voyage, travel accounts, yes, like the one uh, of, of Recherche in the 1830s. So this is, in short, what my, my book is about. It has taken some time to write it, but it is... Uh, Kind of, it's, it's of course themes that I know, it's things that I've been working with for many years. Together with a colleague, I'm about to uh, publish a big Faroese literary history. Um, so it's part of, of my work with literary history after all. And the, at the end, at the back of the book, there is a, a detail from a, 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 this picture, which is. Um, the, the artist is a, is a con, he uh, makes art out of concepts, and here is the nation building. A nation building in the Faroe Islands is based on importation of all sorts of things, you see. But not only things, also ideas and literary forms are things received from, from yeah, abroad, from Denmark first through, and mo most of things thoughts and literary forms that come to the Faroe Islands, I'll stop in a moment, or right away, come all, often filtered through Denmark, through uh, periodical, through, uh, yeah, media. So, thank you. So, um, I'm Daniel Chartier, and I'm professor at the University du Québec à Montréal. And I will talk about the issues and challenges of literary histories, I put it in plural, of the Inuit world, the Nunavik, Nunavut, uh, Nunatsiavut, and Greenland. Uh, this is part of a broader research that we do at the uh, Laboratory on uh, Research on Images of the North in Montreal. So the general scientific program is recomplexifying the North and the Arctic, and this is in Axis One, which is historicizing the North and the Arctic. So it's a part of bringing new history uh, of the North, and of course, um, Manan's work is part of this axis. My historical background is that I worked in a huge project called uh, La Vie Littéraire au Québec, history, uh, the uh, uh, literary life in Quebec, and this project aims to write the history of Quebec from 19, uh, uh, 1763 to today. And it's actually a project that began in 1970 with first the Dictionary of Works and led from 1991 to today to uh, six volumes of literary history. So it takes a lot of time to write literary history, and there's four more volumes to come. And uh, this uh, new literary history tried to see not only at the works, but also education, context, uh, reception, freedom of uh, speech, censorship, the publishers, uh, aesthetic, external influences, and work. So all that matters to have a complete history of literary life. So as you see, 52 years is a challenge to get funded for so many years. And of course, people change in this project, but it's a team of 12 professors and 20 assistants since then that write uh, literary history. So for me, for the project, for the Inuit, it, uh, it gives me the idea that it is necessary to have collective work to do uh, history. Uh, we need to adapt our methodology to the specific cultural cases. Um, it's good not only to look at the works, but also at the cultural, political, and aesthetic context around them. And also we need to create tools to take into account uh, the full extension of this work. 
So in the case of the Inuit world, and of course I put a few pictures because we have images of the Inuit, but we don't know their work usually. Uh, it's still a, a remote context, and only one generation ago people lived in very different uh, type of life. Uh, but from the 1960s, they began to write in magazine and to write books, so it's a new history that is beginning uh, for the Inuit. Inuit, of course, are the, the main people of the Arctic region, so that's why it's so important from Siberia to uh, Greenland, and it's a population of about 150,000 people, but as we will see, it, they have different contexts, and each context, maybe we should write a different literary history out of it, even if some uh, intellectuals try to see the Inuit as one people around the globe. Uh, the influence uh, from Europe has been mainly negative with some positive points on the Inuit, uh, the imposition of a social and economic system, illnesses that didn't exist uh, that led to abandonment of traditional culture, family, social problems, but also increased uh, standard of living and education with really big difference between the territory, let's say Greenland and Nunavik, for example. At the end, we have a cultural loss and a very quick adaptation to new modes. Uh, Sheila Watt-Cloutier, that's one of the main um, intellectuals from the Inuit, say that the Inuit has lived in one generation what other people lived in many centuries, uh, living really from a nomadic life to uh, a, um, a numeric life, uh, a digital life in one generation. The Inuit are united by one language. There's a new word that emerged uh, three years ago called Inuktut. Inuktut means all the Inuit language, Inuktitut, Greenlandic, and so on. So Inuktut would be the, the basic of it. Uh, but the variation are extremely important and influenced by European language, English, French, Danish, and German mainly. And, of course, the, the establishment of uh, the power from the south to the Arctic uh, the administrative structure made that most Inuit actually have m multiple identities. Uh, they can be uh, from Nunavik, Inuit, from Quebec, from Canada, so it's a very complicated uh, structure of uh, identity. And from the outside, of course, we see the Inuit as the, uh, the, the man facing the essential in the artist climate, so it has, a, I would say, a universal value or an experience that is seen as universal by uh, people from the outside. So if we look at a pan-Inuit perspective, it's a very wide territory. It's actually the main, the main area of the Arctic that is occupied by Inuits. What Inuit culture or Inuit literature can bring to a northern and Arctic uh, context, from a Nordic context, of, of course, uh, it opens an indigenous colonial and Arctic uh, perspective uh, to uh, the uh, Nordic studies. And also their experience, their cultural expression transmit a unique point of view on the Arctic. Of course, again, not by the number, by the, by the specificity of their experience that they contribute to world heritage. And from a geographical point of view, the Inuits see themselves as a sentinel of the Arctic. They are those who look at the climate change. They are those who look about the situation and want to testify to the rest of the world. We are also in a context of indigenous historical point of view, and as you will see, it will lead to some uh, spe specific uh, conditions. Uh, of course, the differences of indigenous culture are mostly defined by a nomadism that is not so far away in time, um, uh, an integration with nature that is said to be uh, closer than uh, uh, European or North American uh, cultures, and traditional practices and language. Uh, when we look also at the Inuit and the First Nation, they share a similar uh, political, uh, political cultural situation uh, that led in the recent decades to an awareness and a movement of social and political demands. Of course, uh, we talk about silence, that these nations face colonialism, racism, silencing of their belief, practice, cultures, and language that led to what is called politically officially, like now in Canada, that uh, Canada agreed that the, the uh, federal government proceed to a cultural genocide of the people of the First Nation and Inuit. So what do you do after to repair, to, to try to see what is to be done? But the first gesture was to admit that this happened. 
uh, when you, we look at those literature and culture, there's a big deficit of infrastructure, no archive, very few uh, publishers, like uh, Cyril uh, told us this morning, uh, very few libraries, museum, difficulty to access to education. So it, it's, it's extremely difficult. Like, for example, in Nunavik today, there's no public library yet. So when we say we want the Inuit to produce book, and you never see books in a public place, only in houses, of course, it, the, the book is seen as a foreign form of expression. Some facts about Inuit literature, of course, it's a very highly complex case of contemporary time. If you see a written literature that happened in the last 20 or 30 years, it's very different than our literature that began in the 19th century mainly uh, as a literature. So uh, today, the book is not as important in culture as it has been in the 19th century. So, of course, they find new way of expression uh, adapt to the time. And there's a mixture of oral and written that is still alive, uh, even in literary forms uh, that we see uh, and that we can read, and of course in some practices. And to add to the complexity of the case, it is in cohabitation with many other languages. And depending on the case, uh, to, uh, it is written in Inuktut, in Danish, in English, and in French. So a literature with many languages, with many centers, uh, with a lack of infrastructure, but still it exists. So what are the issues and, and challenge? First, the first issue is what is the corpus of work? Uh, you don't go in a library and say, I want to read Inuit literature. It, it's not the way it works. So which authors? And which one are Inuit or define themselves as Inuit? Uh, and there's no book about Inuit literature as a list that you would read and the best uh, thing. Uh, which languages, in which periodicals even that we find. I thought there was about uh, 15 periodicals on the Inuit uh, society and a researcher that worked and produced a book and she found out uh, 200 Inuit periodicals in history. So you see, we don't have the basic tools to go to the corpus yet. Um, and of course, what uh, kind of publication, how to deal with the absence of books. Those are major questions for literary history. The institutional issues is that the institution and community are very in unstable. Uh, there's a big difference, let's say, for, for example, between Greenland that has a great institution and the other territory is completely different. Uh, there's a widespread in Denmark, in Canada, in Quebec, everywhere in the United States about uh, this culture, like a library and don't, they don't know how to read the, the titles of the book. They don't know where to classify them. So there's a need to, for the major institution to know about this literature and, of course, a need for cooperation between them. So the first thing to do to write history, uh, history of literature would be to create basic tools that we, you have in other literature, like what is the corpus? Uh, what are the Inuit works? Uh, what is an Inuit author? Um, how to establish a timeline that is specific to the Inuit and not from the outside, and how to find basic information about authors. Uh, the challenge is, uh, is also to get the works available. They are in community periodicals sometimes, in many languages. They are ignored by national institutions without a tradition for archival preservation. So we need also to produce books in order to study the literature. So we are at the beginning of creating the corpus and then publishing them in a book form to study them. We are really at the first step of this literature. Um, so we have to publish while writing history. Uh, the concept of copyright is extremely difficult to explain also to the Inuit. And we have to keep books available to the community and to the outside. And there's also, uh, at the end, some methodological challenges uh, when we first had this project with Inuit to establish a timeline of Inuit uh, culture, they said, why the time? Time is not a concept for us, but family trees are. Space is. So they were saying, if you're using a timeline, you're using a concept that is not so important in our culture. So it brings back the idea of history itself for us to, to, to adapt to this, uh, to this literature. And also the genre that they write in are extremely different than the one we are using. The concept of fiction doesn't exist, so it's a different way to, to conceive what is uh, imagined. Um, 
and we are generally in the last 10 years in the context of methodological indigenization. So we try to use the, 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 the European concept and adapt them with the thought of indigenous uh, people. Um, so some steps uh, to finish that uh, were done. So at first we had first to do this uh, book about what are the periodicals. If we want to see the works, we have to find the periodicals and the librarian help us to do it. There was a first regional uh, history of Nunavik that was written as a thesis. And we have this uh, website that we set for us and for the others uh, to try to see in three languages, in Inuktitut, French, and English, uh, what are those works that we can find, uh, to write biographies with the authors, often by finding information on the Internet, on finding, uh, emailing the people to write those biographies. So until now, we have 100 uh, Inuit authors uh, that, are, uh, that we find out to, uh, to, to write biographies. Uh, we also present to the works in many languages and try this timeline of facts between Greenland, Nunavik, Nunavut. We also publish books. Uh, that's strangely important in a project like this to get the book in a uh, get the works in a book format. So, what are the ethical principles that we have to add when we work with indigenous or Inuit uh, history? We need cooperation with. Inuit uh, organization. You cannot do it from the university side. You have to uh, have uh, agreement with uh, cooperation with organism. Uh, the choice of translation should be always the case of the Inuit and not us that decide what is to be published. And we have to try co-publication between organism from uh, Inuit society and uh, other publisher. If we can, introduction by an Inuit author instead of an, inner, uh, an author from the outside, uh, authorization and copyright is more complicated because the, the individual agreement is not enough. Uh, the community has to give the right to translate. So it's not only the writer but the community that will allow uh, the work and allow the translator to be selected. Uh, and we have to be sure that the works are still available for the community and for the others and not only for the university. So. You see there's some challenges that we have to face when we uh, work in, uh, in this concept. Partnership are extremely difficult to maintain. Um, multilinguism is also a big uh, challenge. Uh, there's very few translators, and, but I think it, it leads to uh, some social and cultural change in community when they know that this work has been translated in another language and you inform the community after. So you have a community work plus a basic development of tools to finally arrive at something that could be, at the end, uh, literary history. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Sumarlidi Islason. I come from uh, the University of Iceland, the uh, Faculty of uh, Humanities. Uh, I've been working on uh, representations of uh, Iceland and Greenland for a long time, and uh, in the last four years I have published two books on the matter. One, uh, understandable for you, published in France four years ago by the, by the University of Quebec Press, and if you are interested, you can, uh, you can have a look. And uh, the other one, that is a bit heavier, uh, in uh, in uh, in Icelandic, like this, uh, uh, published two years ago, uh, with yeah on the other way around maybe. Uh, yes, I have been working with uh, representations of uh, of the outside world to Iceland uh, and Greenland and. Uh, the people that live there for a quite quite long time. Uh, the period I'm working with, uh, it extends uh, uh, from the late Middle Ages uh, in the 12th uh, century uh, to the present day. The sources I'm working with uh, uh, are mainly travel books, uh, uh, scholarly publications, novels, and, uh, and graphic material. 
Uh, I have used uh, uh, certain terms and tools in my research uh, to uh, mention some of them. Uh, uh, of course, the periphery, both countries have certainly been marginalized. The term north also, uh, ideas about the far north in general have been transferred to both Iceland and Greenland. You can say the, say the same about the island topos. Um, those ideas have also been transferred uh, to both uh, countries. The same about the terms utopia and dystopia. Both countries have been described uh, in accordance with these terms. Racism also is, uh, uh, has accompanied uh, descriptions of the two countries and nationalism and uh, colonialism have also been important tools uh, uh, of my analysis. Uh, my, my goal has been to give an overview of uh, how representations of these countries have, yes, I completely, my goal has been to give an overview of how representations of these countries have, uh, have appeared over the past nearly thousand years. Initially, my research uh, was based on Iceland, but later I expanded my scope and decided also to explore the external images of Greenland. Both countries are in the high north, similar and different at the same time, uh, which makes comparison useful. The overall aim has therefore been to highlight what has characterized the discourses about these countries, both what is in common as the differences. Uh, in short, my hypotheses in this context uh, are as follows. Uh, up until 1800, both countries were largely considered outside Euro part of the Arctic, barren and cold worlds, where only hardy animals uh, thrived and hardly considered uh, viable for humans. The people were estimated to have much in common with animals and were more or less without civilization. The cold and bad north simply reigned there. Uh, one moment, it's a bit too early. Uh, Ancient discourses of faraway lands and islands had a profound effect on the accounts of Iceland and Greenland until about 1500, but from the 16th century onwards, clearer signs of colonialism and uh, racism can be seen. According to those discourses, these islands in the north could uh, be both treasure islands and islands of happiness on one hand and devilish islands on the other. Dualism was therefore common also with regard to the inhabitants. So people were either primitive and good on one side or immoral, dark and evil on the other. In general, we can say that the discussion about these two islands until around 1800 was similar to descriptions of uh, colonies and remote areas in other parts of the world, though with addition of cold and ice. Uh, yes, we should uh, have the next one. In the 19th century, the discourses on Iceland changed fundamentally, which was uh, not the case about Greenland. The dominant discourses about the two country, countries gradually became different. Nationalism took Iceland into its hands, if one can say so, and created from it a Germanic utopia, a kind of Hellas of the North. In this context, emphasis was placed on the Icelandic and Nordic medieval heritage in medieval Iceland, a model society uh, have been established both in terms of cultural life and social system. 
racism became dominant and Icelanders became the archetype of the Germanic in many descriptions from this period. Uh, strangely enough, a land that had been considered almost uninhabitable and people who had been considered uh, largely without civilization was moved to the center and considered exemplary. This attitude can be said to have prevailed until uh, the middle of the 20th century. Icelanders were considered descendants of Nordic Vikings who had formed a model society in the Middle Ages, and now that legacy was cultivated by the modern Icelanders, educated, creative people who were sometimes described as a kind of noble savages, where innocence prevailed, and, but sometimes as modern Vikings. And partly this discourse has prevailed until the 21st century. Let us keep in mind, however, that other discourses uh, also existed at the same time, describing Iceland as a distant outpost where the inhabitants had barely adapted to civilization. This development did not become the fate of Greenland. It remained outside Europe, and the colonial and racist attitudes relaved, prevailed in many ways in the attitude towards the country and the Greenlanders. Uh, when we look at the present, it can be stated that both Iceland and Greenland are generally regarded uh, as modernized countries, uh, where a similar life is lived as in many other parts of Europe. This is, special, this is especially true of Iceland. But uh, at the same time, in the discourses of the two countries, one can discern uh, the otherness similar to what has long been customary, based on romantic ideas about the north and distant Islands. It must be borne in mind here that tourism uh, is becoming an increasingly important uh, part of the economies uh, of these countries. Tourism takes advantages of the romantic attitudes uh, that have dominated concerning the far north since the 19th century and have shaped the attractiveness of the Arctic, magnificent nature, untouched uh, islands, sparsely uh, populated areas, uh, and in recent years, the great changes that are visible in the far north due to climate change have contributed to this interest. Could I have uh, a new slide? The, the tourism industry has certainly used the ideas of the Arctic to attract tourists. And in this context, context, it is interesting that now it is no less domestic stakeholders who shape the images of the two countries rather than the external ones as was common in the past. But these ideas uh, are often based, based in large part on the attitudes that have been developed towards the two countries in past centuries. Uh, the subjects I have viewed here uh, uh, in brief uh, uh, are discussed in these books that are somewhere here. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, how to continue with uh, these uh, uh, discussions. Uh, for those of us uh, uh, who live in, uh, in small language com communities like in Iceland uh, or the Faroe Islands, it is of course important to have translations like, like this book uh, translated into French and, uh, and uh, 
uh, of course, we uh, we publish uh, articles in uh, in English, but uh, but if I, f for example, should have uh, the other uh, more heavy book translated, it it is difficult because of uh, it is simply really expensive. Uh, it's one thing. The second thing is uh, simply collaboration, uh, comparing our research with uh, what is uh, uh, what is being done in uh, in uh, in other areas in the in the north in northern Scandinavia and the Faroe Islands and in Greenland. And it's also important, of course. Um, I, I want to mention the third. Uh, uh, a possibility or or what I find important is in this uh, in this connection it it is the conversation between uh, internal and uh, external uh, representations uh, uh, i mean how people react uh, to the to the external uh, representations uh, and how they respond to them, uh, and uh, how they make the attitudes of uh, the, the outside world uh, their, uh, their own, and how they change uh, uh, the, the attitudes of the outside world. Uh, one, uh, one, more, uh, uh, one more thing that I want to add is uh, that... Uh, there, there, there has been much, uh, there has been quite much uh, research on the representations from the outside, but, uh, but maybe it is uh, um, how the outside world has uh, looked at uh, these uh, these areas in the far north. But uh, maybe it is now time to do it the other way around. To, uh, to uh, start on research on uh, how, not we, but <laughs> I mean, how in the past people from these areas, how they have described uh, the, uh, the uh, world they visited. Uh, uh, I can mention that uh, uh, there exists a very interesting text from the 17th, 18th, 18th and 19th centuries from uh, Icelandic authors where they describe their travels uh, uh, in different parts of the world. And, uh, and uh, uh, I know actually that two of these texts are uh, now being translated. Uh, I think they are late... Uh, I think they are late, uh, late 18th century texts. They are now being translated into English. Uh, and the last, uh, last thing I want to mention, uh, and which uh, I have been uh, working with lately, is uh, to uh, consider how, or research on how, uh, Self images in the north and uh, mainly in the high north have been shaped by reflection on other areas in the north or high north. And this, this applies, for example, uh, uh, to the relationship between Iceland and Greenland as the shaping of the Icelandic identities uh, up to the latter part of the 20th century was closely linked uh, uh, was uh, closely linked uh, uh, to attitudes towards Greenland and uh, and uh, uh, the efforts in Iceland to convince the the outside world uh, that the two countries uh, were uh, were totally different uh, that Iceland was Europe but uh, but Greenland was Arctic uh, uh, that is not the case anymore. I mean, uh, now the point is to be, now the point for Iceland is to be part of the Arctic. First, it became part of the West Nordic area, uh, now the Arctic. So, 
and and this is actually the matter I have been focusing on the uh, lately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to come here and uh, present my book on Arctic literature from a Norwegian perspective. Uh, you see here the Norwegian version with a painting on the cover uh, by the French painter François Biard. He was took part in the uh, French Recherche expedition. However, he made the painting before he left Paris, actually, um, before he went to the Arctic. And, and the, in the French version, it's a painting by uh, Pierre de Balke from North Cape, Northern Norway, from the 1840s. First, um, a little bit about definitions. Um, a fluid definition of the Arctic is seen in the concept of Nordicity, a term coined by the Canadian geographer Louis Ed Edmund Hamlin in 1965. He links northernness to a series of criteria, among them altitude, which means the Alps in southern and central Europe are included in his concept of Nordicity. The cr uh, criteria are based not only on climate, geography and vegetation, but also on human activities, infrastructure, population, industry and so on. In a way, that means that an area can lose or gain northernness. For Hamlin, demographic and economic activity have meant a decrease in the severity of conditions in the north and led to a process of denordernization. The North moves always out of reach, writes the Scottish literary scholar Peter Davison in the book The Idea of North. One can find oneself in the South without desiring to go farther south, but the North always eludes us and is always out of reach, he says. As you advance towards it, the true North recedes away northwards. Davison po also points out that the phrase we leave for the north tonight, conjures images of going to a harsh place, a rougher climate, a barren place farther away. The north is a challenge. We are heading south tonight, gives association of traveling for the sake of pleasure, enjoyment and warmth. One heads south to meet others, one heads north to find oneself. Things southern are often associated with the feminine. Things northern are associated with the masculine. Shell Grace stressed the same sentiment in her book Canada and the Idea of North from 2007, but from a different and more critical approach to the tradition of associating northern things with masculinity. It assumes an ob objectifiable feminine other in the physical terrain that can be indeed must be, penetrated, revealed, put to use, tamed and controlled. Grace claims that the typical Arctic discourse is masculine. Young white men have traditionally traveled north to bolster their egos. If a man survives a series of tests, dangerous rivers, extreme cold, loneliness and wild animals, he is not only superior to the north, but he can also return home to claim his place in society. The masculinity of a scientist or explorer expands by going north. Grace also points, however, to literature that opposes the idea of conquering the north, in which the traveller seeks to be at peace with the north and to experience harmony instead of confrontation, finding recognition rather than challenges. The Norwegian polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen produced an important cultural historical uh, work called In Northern Mists, Arctic Exploration in Early Times, in which he scrutinized and tried to explain our knowledge and cultural notions of the North from ancient times onwards. Nansen was at the height of his career as a polar explorer when he started writing this book. He was the first explorer to cross Greenland's inland ice cap in 1888, and he completed a three-year expedition to the North Pole in 1893-96 aboard the now famous schooner Fram. In his book, he also reflected on why people 
sought out northern latitudes and why the people of his time found the north so fascinating. In answering these questions, Nansen referred to the 13th century educational text Konung Skugsha, The King's Mirror. This encyclopedic work is framed as a conversation between a wise father and his son who has a thirst for knowledge about geography, merchantry and statecraft, among other things. After hearing stories about Greenland and the Greenland Sea, the boy asks why people travel to such cold and treacherous areas. His father answers by listing various reasons, the competitive instinct, honor and glory, excitement, a third for knowledge, and the hunt for natural resources. Similarly, Nansen emphasizes the human nature when he associated the Arctic with the development of the human race, and when he says the history of polar exploration shows us the power of the unknown of the mind of man. For Fritjof Nansen, the Arctic and Arctic explorations are conspicuously associated with masculinity, but not only that, as well as with a spiritual yearning. And he writes, Ever since the Norsemen's earliest voyages, Arctic expeditions have certainly brought material advantages to the human race, such as rich fisheries, whaling and sealing, and so on. They have produced scientific results in the knowledge of hitherto unknown regions and conditions, but they have given us far more than this. They have tempered the human determination for the conquest of difficulties. They have furnished a school of manliness and self-conquest in the mind, midst of the slackness of changing times, and have upheld noble ideals before the rising generation. Arctic nature embodies moral qualities, or to put it another way, in an encounter with the Arctic, moral awakening is a natural consequence of having to cope with the demands set by modern nature. Nansen also felt that the awesome beauty of the Arctic and traveling in the north produced a certain joie de vivre. Such thoughts find resonance in fictional literature from Nansen's, Nansen's time and far into the 1900s, particularly in relation to the masculine ideal. The cold north and the Arctic serve as a place to test manhood in Nordic children books from the interwar period. If you look at literature for boys, the Svalbard archipelago, half bay between the Norwegian mainland and the North Pole, is a place where boys become men, a place of transition from childhood to adulthood. This definition is obvious in Fritjof Nansen's book, In Northern Mist, and is clearly presented in the Boy Scouts on Spitsbergen, The Summer Adventures of Two Norwegian Boys, by Peder Flint, published in 1922. The story concerns the summer exploits of two Boy Scouts on Spitsbergen, the largest of the Svalbard Islands, but starts at the Majorstun Primary School in Christiania, uh, the name of Oslo, um, where the deer patrol from the local scout troop has gathered to say goodbye to the two oldest boys, 15 and 16-year-old Arne and Klaus. An uncle has secured them a summer job as deck boys on the sealing hunting ship Hilmar. In his farewell speech, the leader of the deer patrol claims that the two are heading for the Arctic Ocean to become men, which is what all true sc scouts strive for. The scouts meet their real tests after a long sea journey, coming face to face with a snarling polar bear. Both boys carry rifles but are paralyzed with fright. Arne saves the day when he remembers the scout's motto, Be prepared, which brings him out of his paralysis. The scouts survive their uh, rite of passage to manhood and can return home to continue their education. The Arctic is both a transitional and transitory space. The defining aspects of the genre is Havs Roman. We don't have a good English translation. The Arctic Ocean novel is a typical Nordic genre. Um, and the setting uh, is the Arctic Ocean and the occupations of the characters. Uh, we uh, are here not dealing with tourists, not with adventurous scientists or seafarers. The Characters here are trappers and hunters who chase seals, walruses, foxes and polar bears across the ice. 
This ice which penetrates into the fjords is a constant threat to hunting, fishing and trapping vessels, which can be overturned or even trapped in the ice until spring if winter comes early. The ice is an important place for seal and walrus hunting, but it is a dangerous place for hunter. Lars Hansen from Tromsø debuted in 1926 with At the Whim of Nature on Spitsbergen, and here I found a French translation, actually. The first novel actually dealing with the Arctic themes aimed at a broad readership. Svalbard is the main setting in his novels, in addition to eastern Greenland and Nova Yosembia and the White Sea. Lars Hansen is able to describe real-life hunting and trapping expeditions within the constraints of writing a novel. He also tells true stories about historical people and events using statistics and accounting ledgers from trappers and describing tools and equipment. The reader is therefore doubly committed. We get fantasies on the one hand and historical facts on the other. The reader of fiction gets what he desires and the documentary reader receives sustenance as well. Norwegian, and we move forward in time, Norwegian author Tore Evan Svane's novel To the East Coast of Greenland from 2016 can be seen as an implicit criticism of the traditional Arctic Ocean novel and the glorification of hunting and masculinity. The hunting methods are described as unethical and the masculine environment is depicted in its most grotesque form. The title of the book in translation to the East Coast of Greenland may sound attractive, but the novel's norm expresses a clearly negative attitude towards the Norwegian sealing industry. The hunt is not portrayed as a proud and traditional occupation. It is rather depicted as a type of barbarism. In line with this, children's books from the 1970s onwards also are increasingly informed by ecological perspective. To Larsen's book, Espen on the Ice from 1981 looks at polar bears from an ecological perspective. The location is the island of Kongsøya, northeast of Svalbard, and the reader follows a research expedition. There is an element of hunt in the book, but the purpose now is to tag polar bears in order to monitor their migration routes. Children's books in recent years have shown concern for the dwindling number of polar bears and the scientific and the scientist is replacing the hunter as the hero. Uh, the travel novel. The Norwegian author Anne Beragde's novel Suna Frigida 1995 is about a round trip sea journey around Svalbard on a tourist boat from Longyearbyen. Tourists from several countries have arrived at Svalbard by aircraft. The small boat, named Eve, holds ten passengers and nine crew. The book is part travelogue and part crime novel. The protagonist, Bea, plans to murder one of the passengers, her old teacher, Turid, who had sexually abused her at high school. In addition, illegal Polar bear hunting is an important part of the plot. The novel presents us with many characters and the plot is intricate. However, the journey itself gives a clear structure to the story. The boat is a stage for many constellations as it moves through a monumental landscape where simplicity stands in contrast to the com complex social relations on board. Several reviewers praised the precise description of Svalbard during the journey and the impressions of polar environments created by the author. We always know where we are as the author names the locations, making it easy to follow the boat with a map. The title of the novel, Zona Frigida, means cold zone. We find this des designation on ancient maps pre-1600 as men began to explore the Arctic regions. The title is Double Entendre. Bea was the victim of sexual assault when she was young, which has affected her relationships or rendered her in the eyes of one of her male partners sexually frigid. She manages to process her trauma in the course of the trip round Svalbard. Arctic nature provides some kind of purification and Bea gains new insights into herself. Her contact with nature gradually helps her forget the vendetta she had planned on board the boat. The murder in this crime novel is cancelled as a result of the powerful impression the Arctic has on the protagonist. And the last uh, group I would like to mention is, uh, is a category called the Arctic Pastoral. Why? 
Arctic pastoral? Well, polar narratives as a whole are more characterized by wilderness discourses than pastoral discourses. However, some of the written accounts contain passages of a pastoral mode or a pastoral moment where the traveler, hunter or scientist seems to reflect on their bonds to nature. In these moments, not only the traditional heroic discourse is challenged, but also the ideology of progress embedded in modernity. Uh, certain aspects of Arctic literature that constitute a type of modern pastoral displaying affinities with the genre of nature writing, eco-criticism and vitalism. Uh, in the book What is Pastoral, Paul Alpers argues for not limiting the concept to to a golden age or a specific landscape. For, for Alpers, pastoral is not a particular genre, but rather mode in the sense of an attitude or tone in the text. Uh, the pastoral contrasts with the dominant masculinity discourses of polar literature, where a man proves himself in a series of tests. That is, if past will confirm his superiority. The pastoral has more to do with being at peace in the place, transforming the wilderness into a dwelling place, to care for his home in the Heideggerian sense, experience immersion rather than confrontation, recognition rather than challenge. Uh, for instance, we find this in uh, Fleet of Nansen. Here's an interview with the British newspaper Paul Moll Gazette, where Nansen writes, uh, he is asked, what do you think about the Arctic? He has been then had several expeditions behind him. I think of the Arctic summer rain. I think of the sunshine reflected from mountains of snow and ice, shining upon little lakes of clear rippling water, where hundreds of seals play, playfully splash the water into glistening sprays of rainbow hues. What is the charm of the Arctic? Health, glorious health. Your muscles twitch with a desire for action. You eat like a horse and sleep twelve or fourteen hours without a dream. Before you is the vast unknown, all around you is silence and solitude. In winter the scene is almost as beautiful as in the summer. The nights are clear, the moon and stars shine bright upon the sea of soft white snow. The north is here not depicted as dark and menacing, but as bright, beautiful and healthy. So Nansen emphasizes the, the positive side of the divided image of the Arctic. So, uh, so do Helge Ingsta in his book East of the Great Glacier from 35. Helge Ingsta described his winterings in East Green, Greenland as taking place in a lonely landscape in all its sober strength in the fairy light of star, stars and the shimmering aurora. For Ingsta, this landscape inspires another way of living, a life of conscious simplicity, to use Alper's terms. For three days we strode on, slept in a tent and boiled the water for our tea over a fire of fragrant heather, the silent joy of vagabond life in the mountains of Greenland. The simplicity of life is reflected in the style uh, of writing, here is a river and I am tired. The landscape is depicted as both simple and majestic. The daily tasks are portrayed one by one without conflicting considerations and the silence stands in contrast to the urban cacophony. Ca 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 and, the, and the last... Um, uh, the hubris of man and civilization is in the pastoral scale down to the shepherd, a figure of humility who lives a life on conscious simplicity. And there are, I think, several parallels to this, for instance, in how the Norwegian trapper Henry Rudi describes his life at Svalbard. Freedom does not mean to relax for days in a cozy and warm cabin. Freedom means taking care of one tools and gear every single day so you can say to yourself that now I have done what should be done. I have prevailed over the external forces, which is bad weather and darkness. I have prevailed over the inner problems, indifference and melancholy. I have won over powerful forces. Therefore, I am free. Up in the north, the days stand out in their stark reality, keep on working or surrender. So life in the Arctic is portrayed in terms of simplicity and unequivocalness as a contrast to the complexity of modernity. The popularity of these polar uh, accounts is probably due to the fact that they show that the combination of explorer and hunter suggests a kind of uh, other way, uh, way of life than modern uh, civilization has. 
So, a quick conclusion. On the one hand, polar expeditions in the late 1800s and early 1900s are expressions of modern science and rationality, with polar voyages as exponent of civilization's very latest technology. But on the other hand, yearning towards the desolate Arctic is perceived as a way to escape modernity. This paradox is discussed by Michael Robinson in The Coldest Crucible. He shows how the Arctic expeditions from 1819s onwards no longer necessarily argue for the expansion of civilization with science as companion, but just as often take a critical stand. According to this line of thinking, explorers sailed north not to extend but to escape the reach of civilization to find a route that returned them in a symbolic sense to the original state of nature. And this frame can contain Nansen and Ingsta and Rudi, I think. So, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> I have here with me Rika Rossi, who works as a professor of Finnish literature at the University of Helsinki. We will present you our project entitled The Historical Poetics of Finnish Literature that we started this year. The project is funded by Kana Foundation and it will be going on until the end of 2025. So we have four years to complete the project. There are altogether seven members in this project. Besides me, there is Mari Hatavara, Hanna Samola and Lena Romu working at the University of Tampere. And besides Riikka, there is Vesa Haapala and Eva-Liisa Bastman working at the University of Helsinki. All of us are specialists of poetics. We have studied genres, narration, literary currents and styles, intertextuality and intermediality, comics, emotions in literature, tropes and metrics, and the like. And the main publication of this project will be a book-length academic introduction to Finnish literature that is written from the perspective of historical poetics. But before going into the details of the project, let me remind you of a few facts about Finland. Finland was part of Sweden from the Middle Ages to 1809, when it became an autonomous part of Russia, and it gained independence in 1917. It has two official languages, Swedish and Finnish, and several official minority languages. The three variations of Sami, Karelian, Romani and Slang language. Finnish literature is relatively young because before the 19th century, literature consisted mostly of religious text and occasional poetry. And we also have several oral traditions. Well, why do we need a new literary history? There have been several histories of Finnish literature previously. And also in the last few decades, several histories have been written, focusing on, for instance, Finland-Swedish literature, female literature, northern Finnish writers, and these are based on identity groupings, and these are partial histories. So they focus on some part of the literary history. And there have also been histories that focus on prose literature, contemporary literature, translated literature, and these are based on literary categories. The previous general literary history was published in 1999, and it was edited by Professor Yrjö Varpio and entitled Suomen kirjallisuushistoria 1 to 3. And this is a very good book, but it's too extensive and difficult, for instance, for first and second year university students. So it cannot be used as a textbook at, at, at universities. 
The last general introduction was written in 1981, updated in 1997, and it is badly outdated. And some of you may have read this book or part, parts of this book. It was written by Professor Kai Laitinen and entitled Suomenkirjallisuuden Historia, and parts of it has been translated into different languages. So we need an up-to-date academic introduction to Finnish literature as a university textbook in Finland and abroad. And furthermore, knowledge of past poetics is essential in understanding older literature, also in research. So we think that there will be different kinds of uses for our book that we will be writing in the project. What is new in our project? It brings together usually separate branches of poetics to examine past literature. It foregrounds literary phenomena, not writers or historical contexts. It is inclusive. It examines works by writers that can be associated with Finland in one way or another. For instance, nationality, citizenship, home country. So there is no only one way to be a Finnish writer, but many ways. And the approach is descriptive, not evaluative. We intend not to write a new can canon of classics, but we intend to give a general description of what the literature was like in past periods. We also intend to include previously sidestepped literary forms such as comics and song lyrics and offer new knowledge of the history of literary forms in Finland. Actually, we have already published the first paper of the project and it, it, it has a narratological approach and it corrects the dating of free, in the free indirect discourse in Finnish literature. So there is a new result in the area of narratology. And last but not least, the book aims at teaching literary historical thinking instead of just giving authoritative interpretation of past literature. And we will be bluntly honest about its gaps because there will be several Finnish literature is somewhat extensive, even if it's also a relatively young literature. One way of looking at our project is to employ the metaphors of pearl, oyster and river that have been used in Finnish literary studies to describe the different emphases that are available for literary historians. In in this metaphor, pearls refer to literary works, oysters to writers, and river to historical context. And to describe our approach in this, with this metaphor, I could claim that we will write a history of how the pearls of the past were constructed. And the oysters and the rivers will be acknowledged, but not prioritized. There are two central theoretical concepts that underlie our project and may help you understand it. Descriptive and historical poetics. Descriptive poetics aims at giving detailed descriptions of the various literary means and conventions that characterize and constitute literature. It was theorized in the 1960s and 70s in the Tel Aviv School of Poetics and Semantics, the leader being ben Benjamin Rusovsky, later Harshaw. And the concept was reappraised by Brian McHale in 1994. Descriptive poetics can be synchronic or historical, and it was inspired by Russian formalism instead of French structuralism. So it has a more empirical emphasis than the French version of poetics. 
historical poetic studies literary means uh, of expression as essentially historical phenomena. I have actually studied this tradition and I found that the concept of, not the concept, but the idea of historical poetics was created in German Romanticism. And I, f I found three versions of how to understand historical Poetics in the history, I've written a paper on it recently in Finnish, and I named the variations diachronic, contextual, and diachronic contextual approach. And the names pretty much sum up what they are like. And our approach is diachronic contextual in that we will be examining the changing poetics of Finnish literature with reference to contextual factors. And Rika will continue here. Thank you. So, um, it is evident that uh, we are working on a very large project that includes many risks and challenges, and uh, in my part, I shall focus on the potential risk and uh, raise up some challenges. Of course, none of the terms in the history of Finnish literature can be taken as granted, but have to be defined. And uh, it can be said that Finnish literature is a cultural and methodological construct, not a sharp-edged phenomenon to be found as an entity of the past. Uh, Finnish literature has traditionally been seen as consistent of most of work, works written in Finnish and in Swedish, but the traditional approach has uh, recently been talented for furthering a kind of methodological nationalism. And a relevant question related to this issue is whether the official minority, minority languages may have literatures of their own, and there is, of course, the obvious case of Sami literature that we have been discussing today, but there are also Romani literature and other possible uh, minorities. Uh, there are authors who write in Arabic in, in Finland and so on. Uh, in our perspective, we see, perceive Finnish literature as multilingual, multicultural, and transnational. And, of course, we comment the choices uh, we make. It is important to teach also uh, concepts and theoretical approaches to literary history, uh, not only uh, facts and uh, what has been published and lists. So, in a way, one can say that our, we are working on a mission, mission impossible. Our object of study um, is impossible in the sense that, uh, that we cannot read all the past works, but hopefully uh, representatives of um, uh, each phenomena. And we have to really deep dig uh, to create a corpus of texts. Um, and uh, some areas have been uh, studied more, and there are some uh, areas have, that have not been studied much. And we shall also include uh, comic song lyrics, history of narration into our corpus. Um, and uh, of course, uh, in it, history uh, studies of history, it has been quite mainstream to use uh, digital methods uh, in uh, studying big corpuses of texts. In this project, we don't have yet digital methods in use, but of course, this core project allows us to define the criteria for further uh, digital um, humanities project that could uh, enable uh, to uh, go through big data uh, material. And of course, we can benefit from previous research. In recent years, there have been many reinterpretations of uh, historical period styles in Finnish literature. Uh, I have myself written a book on primitivism in Finnish literature. Uh, and um, there is a recent book on decadence in Finnish literature. Uh, and, uh, and many other literary styles and movements have been uh, reinterpreted in pre recent years, so uh, we can also benefit from this corpus of new research. Uh, of course, more challenges uh, 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 come up. Uh, one evident challenge is how, how, how shall we actually 
uh, treat literatures of so-called stateless nations such, such as Sami literature or Romani literature, uh, oral tradition and its various forms also in contemporary literature, like uh, uh, live poetry is very uh, uh, important genre in, in Finnish uh, uh, contemporary literature. Um, then, of course, transnationality, how to identify the numerous transnational connections between Finnish and other literatures. Some of these connections and uh, uh, transnational uh, contacts have been studied, but there are also lots of uh, questions that uh, uh, need answers. And then maybe, um, of course, the concepts are, are, are challenges it itself. Um, themselves, uh, what kind of meta-language shall we use when we are defining historical poetics? And what is culturally sensitive? Uh, can we use the same concepts when we are working on, uh, for instance, Sami literature and uh, literature written in Finnish? Whose perspective are, uh, do these concepts represent? Uh, where do they, do they come from? Then, uh, since we are today gathered together to discuss the issues and challenges of writing uh, literary histories uh, uh, in uh, northern literatures, literatures of the north, we would also benefit from uh, collaborations between different various researchers who are working on the same kind of problems uh, and maybe a kind of comparative perspective and discussion how literary histories have been written elsewhere in other contexts how, for instance, has, has Sami literature been treated in recent Swedish and Norwegian literary histories? Are there, how have been Romani writers uh, been treated in other literary histories of the North? And maybe uh, we are also interested to compare Finnish literature with other small literatures or to see whether there are similar kind of phenomena. Can we speak of... Uh, some genres or poetic conventions that are particularly uh, um, characteristic of literatures of the North, uh, or uh, what are the kind of general conventions and what are the original variations, it's uh, very often a uh, difficult issue to define. So in conclusion, uh, uh, we we may conclude that Finnish literature is relatively small and young, which enables our approach, although there are many challenges and risks included. Uh, and in this project, we are focusing on literary phenomena, uh, conventions, uh, and um, general poetics. And in this way, we can redirect also attention from uh, uh, some so-called identity groupings uh, to literary works themselves and uh, also comment them from new perspectives. Um, and uh, so, so we, we can, for instance, redirect uh, discussion from, uh, from the, these kind of groupings to uh, general conventions and genres and, uh, for instance, uh, start looking at uh, comparisons between uh, literatures uh, uh, written in indigenous languages and, uh, and maybe in uh, some uh, Finnish and Swedish, for instance, it, it would be interesting to look at how realist or naturalist novel uh, has been written in, in Sami literature and, and uh, uh, there, there ex exist also examples on this genre in indigenous languages. We don't always, always need to uh, use um, identity groupings as, as uh, historical, literary historical categories. Or we could uh, take a look at avant-garde and modernist poesy, uh, poetry uh, also in various kinds of uh, literatures of the North. But uh, thank you very much and uh, for your attention and now we can continue with the discussion. Thank you, Rika and uh, Saya. Um, so, and to thank you to the other presenters also for uh, exploring so many interesting, stimulating themes and uh, and, and challenges also of uh, of writing s s such 
ambitious uh, literary and cultural histories. Uh, because of the technical problems, we've, uh, we don't have so much time left for the discussion, so I suggest we can open up the floor uh, widely for questions and, uh, and comments mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, because it's recorded, uh, I guess I will also pass the, the microphone so that you can uh, uh, you can uh, uh, ask your questions. So, um, maybe I, I'm, I'm not the main specialist of, of uh, these fields here, but I'd, I had a question for you, uh, Milan, um, because uh, um, uh, I wanted to, to ask you about some of the specific challenges that you met for writing the particular li literary history of the Fiori, uh, of, of, of the Fiori Islands, and, and, uh, and, and if they were, you, you mentioned, uh, I, I think, uh, the fact that uh, in the beginning there were a, a production that was very limited, and then that uh, uh, after a while it became quite quite significant. But they were, were there. Other like more specific challenges that you, that you met in in, in uh, writing such a, um, a history, and were there a previous also histories of uh, of this literature, literature that you could uh, rely on? I didn't follow the the questions you you sent out in, in before because I had left home when when they arrived. So um, this this uh, uh, approach to Faroese literary history is made on on another work I have been doing for many years. But the challenge writing this one has been to, to find out what, what will be of interest for a French audience. So there I have, uh, Daniel has helped me to, to give me some, some uh, ideas about that. And then I have kind of uh, guessed or, so I, I don't know exactly if I, reach things that are interesting for a French audience. For a French or French-speaking audience, <laughs> that would be on the other side of the Atlantic uh, in Quebec. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. But, um, but um, I, we, I don't find it, it, it a specific problem that the, the, the range of literature, Ferris literature, is relatively small. It, it's what it is. So we have to... We have to, to do what there is, and, and uh, when we look at it, it, it follows very much what is going on in the rest of the literary world. It's, it follows the, 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 the thoughts, uh, lines of thoughts and, and forms very much, but there's not so much of it. So you, you just have perhaps one work to, to kind of to, to say, to, to introduce a new, uh, new trend or a new uh, thought in, in Ferris literature. So, and and um, but the big Faroese literature that I'm writing together with a, a, a colleague that we have published the first volume in in 20, 2011, and we are going hopefully to to have the second volume out this year. We are doing something that is similar, perhaps, to the Finnish new Finnish project, but we we are. As it is the first, as it is the first academic literary history in the Faroe Islands. In fact, we have several smaller, shorter literary histories, but this one is is uh, we, we we try to to come around uh, all published books, and uh, it's only now <laughs> when we come to after after the 1960 or something like that, it would be impossible to 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 describe or to have something to say about every book. But before that, when there are 20 books that are, are published or, t 50 or t five uh, literary uh, books, or fine literature, then it's possible. Um, but we have the challenge that, um, that we might, we might uh, uh, offend people because we are saying we are analyzing literature as literature and not as as uh, uh, biography or or um, something high higher uh, we, we are taking it as literature uh, also criticizing it from time to time when when the form it doesn't uh, f 
um, fulfills it, its own uh, uh, what's called project or what uh, its own the author's own aims and so on. So um, yes, but yeah. One more. No, that was it. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, if I can add something on the editorial process, because the Somali dimension also the necessity to 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 chain, to uh, translate to uh, to get known uh, on Malan's book, what we added for the French reader was um, first a timeline, oh, yeah. uh, because we need a timeline to to understand the the evolution of uh, uh, Faris literature, but also to compare to the other literature. Um, a bibliography, uh, simply, that we need to know what are the works that you can read in French. And that's the basic thing. And sometimes li little cultural details that were uh, there, but that was all. And um, I, I think the challenge that you say for Faris literature about the last decades uh, are the same for all the literary history in the world. We give much too, attention, too much attention to the past uh, compared to the number of works. And today we select in a way that I have no idea how the historian of the future will look at the our period where we have thousands of work, and actually they select only on critics. On we are very based on what's in the media, and not on a real critic of the literature. There, when I was studying the 1930s in Quebec literature. Uh, for one bad novel, there were like 20 critics <laughs> for this novel. And now today we are lucky if we have one media uh, re release for one book. So uh, the process of selecting uh, literature is not done today as it was in the past. Sylvain and Uh, just you actually almost uh, said my question because I wanted to ask you and Marlon and Andre can say also about the role you give to critics and the criticism as a genre of, of writing about books uh, presupposes of course a press or media where you can have criticism but also what kind of role would you give uh, well that was about uh, criticism as a genre uh, of literary expression a statistic genre and on the other hand, what role would you give to academic criticism, academic uh, studies on, 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 on uh, works and authors and so on? So how, how does this enter into your uh, literary history projects, uh, you three? I know who wants to start, maybe. Yes, I can start. Well, um, we have very little space to much anything in our book because we have such a large material and so little space. But I, I think that we are going to discuss criticism at some points. And also because it, it, it is important when we discuss classics, we have to say something about which works have been considered as classics because it's often critics that create classics. But but we will distance ourselves from the critics. We will describe and, and take distance. And that is our method, I believe. But but you should ask again after four years. So I would be more specific. Okay. In Theroy's literary history we have we have literary histories written by uh, a philologist, and then a school teacher, and then ourselves. That we are, uh, me and my colleague, we are, are uh, yeah, doctors of literature. So so we don't have so much academic um, criticism to rely on, but we have a lot of, of other uh, criticism, uh, skill skill readers, and and so on and. and uh, but but yeah. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. And we just have the first PhD uh, thesis 
defended this uh, spr last year, last spring, about criticism in Ferris literature, uh, criticism, criticism from the, in the period from 1997 until 2007, or it was it opposite. But um, but so so that's a young discipline in in the Faroe Islands to to deal with the acad academically with criticism. But we are we are using it using it of course in the literary history, yeah. Silva. I believe there is. I believe that um, there is something common in all your uh, projects, which is uh, you face speciality. Speciality space is is a trigger of each of the projects. I think. I mean the definition of of the way you. You construct your project. So it was really a great experience to listen in a row uh, to your uh, uh, presentations because I had the, for a French audience, I had the, um, the impression that your four histories of Nordic literature contributes to a Nordic geography of literature, to a Nordic atlas of literature. And that's something we're trying to do with, with a project that we develop on, on borealism. So it's a, uh, it's a, a spatial turn. So fo focusing on, on, on a Nordic space. And if you, it's, it's a change from history to geography, but it's also, we change the place of where the Nordic is. So it's not a atlas of Nordic uh, literature. It's a Nordic atlas of literature. And, um, uh, so, Thanks a lot for, for, for your contribution. And the question is, have you been thinking about this speciality, the way you, you define your object uh, face to space? It, a question to all your five, but I don't know who wants to. Yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what I was uh, discussing is, I mean, uh, how the cultural geography of uh, these areas have been uh, f formed through the ages, and uh, and I mean, uh, well, uh, both from inside and outside, and I mean, it's it's uh, it 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 really does matter, <laughs> and uh, and I I suppose that uh, and uh, when I think of of uh, the the. The lecture of Henning, uh, we could see the similarities. I mean, uh, how these uh, spaces are, are uh, well, I could not uh, go into any details, but uh, I mean, uh, we can see the similarities, uh, how uh, these spaces are, are constructed in a, in a similar way. So. Okay. Can I add just one more little thing on, on, on this? Uh, because I was struck by, by one thing and, uh, in the ex expose of, of the different uh, themes and genres that uh, uh, are um, maybe dominant. They're not necessarily the dominant ones. They were the one you, you selected in, in a way. But one of the characteristics of the morphology of the space in this area is uh, a lot of ocean and water. And... Um, at the same time, it seems that we we don't hear so much about like sailing and uh, fishing, and it seems that of course are uh, uh, important. In, in but but uh, I was struck by the fact that I, I don't think I, apart from a boat at one point, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't hear ab ab about that. And, um, and it's like more about uh, being on land, being on ice, being you know, hunting, and this kind. Of, well. There's a parallel between hunting and fishing in a way, but so that, I was wondering about the, about this. It's uh, well, the relative absence of, <laughs> of that. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Great. Thank you for the question. I think it's really important because actually in our case, uh, we, me and Saya, we re represent a discipline that it's, uh, is constructed uh, 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 according to borders, uh, Finnish literature is a discipline <laughs> that is actually focused on uh, literature in Finland. And uh, I, I just uh, tried to explain to a French colleague uh, who, who thought that it would be literature written in Finnish, uh, that it includes other languages as well. And uh, so our object of study uh, and our discipline has been based on the idea that uh, 
there are special borders that we can uh, use as a definition to what is Finnish literature. But uh, uh, of course, literature has always been multilinguistic. But uh, but nowadays, uh, in, in we're living in a global world, and uh, and it's uh, uh, it has become more and more challenging to define. How, how can we? Uh, what is Finnish literature? Since there are, it's really multilinguistic, and there are uh, writers who write in Russian, in in Arabic, uh, in in Romani, in other languages within Finland. And on the other hand, we we have Finnish authors in Sweden, and and so on. And how to define the object of the study? It's really important question, and it has been uh, really defined by the space. Um, I would like to continue a little bit on your question about the space. Uh, um, when we are, uh, my colleague and uh, my colleague and I are writing Ferris literature, we we want to to stress that Ferris literature is is a part of European literature and and part of all the tendencies that are in in reaction to what the what the earlier have, has been the the, the main um, thinking that. That it was homegrown. It was Faroese, Faroese. It was uh, uh, invented on the Faroe Islands, whatever the writers wrote, uh, except for ex uh, translations, of course. Uh, but but and 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 this um, way of thinking that that what, what Faroese authors write is 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 no, it doesn't exist and and uh, anywhere else is is part of this nation building thing that has been going on since the beginning of the 20th century and has grown stronger and stronger and now we are this kind of, of questioning that these tendencies but um, when you mentioned the fishery and the sea and all that is not so has not been mentioned so much when at least in my uh, talk I would like to, to uh, show you the, the front cover of this book this is a painting from the 1930s and, and shows one of the main uh, uh, issues of the time. It's the women who stayed at home. And here's a little, little, little ship here that she's looking at. And who's on board this ship? <laughs> the sons, the, the husband, and all the men of, in the village. <coughs> and she's left here. In the modern, modern uh, literature, there are not that... It, it is not this longing, longing uh, sight out to the ships, because the, the nowadays people are, are in, in communicate all the time. So, so this uh, scene you don't see anymore, like this. Um, so and, and the literature does not uh, describe the modern situation of the fish, fishermen and so on. Then you have to go to, for instance, in in our case, the French. Uh, uh, travel log of uh, an author called Karine Nuet, who has been as a, a traveler in Faroe Islands, and she went out with a fishing boat for a couple of months. And that was a modern description of how life is on board on these ships for us. So, and that, my point is by mentioning this is that I would like to include uh, literature written by on other languages and and other other than uh, ethnical Faroese, so to speak, to into Faroese literature because they they describe Faroese uh, beings, Faroese thoughts, and Faroese something reflection and so on. That would be interesting to 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 include in 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 the concept of liter literary history. I think. I would just like to mention, in spite of the title, it's not only Norwegian literature, and I guess it's because of the, the space that's kind of a common space that I also include Danish literature, Swedish literature, and Finnish literature. So we discuss that about the title, but it's mainly Norwegian. But uh, my book is not uh, uh, literary history, but... Uh, um, but uh, it's maybe a, a start. I mean, it's a lot of separate studies, and, and uh, it's kind of a dream of writing a literary uh, a literary history of the Arctic. Uh, but then it had to be circumpolar. It could not be Norwegian. I mean, it had definitely to be circumpolar. So we discussed that in terms of, well, I guess I couldn't do it on my own. We had to be more people to do it. But there are, as, as someone said, a lot of similarities uh, 
be between these uh, the, uh, depictions of the Arctic and um, and uh, rightly, as you said, it's not a lot about fishery. It's more being in the ice, on the ice, uh, on land. Maybe because the fishery was closer to the coast, along the coast, and when they went into the Arctic Ocean or to, to Svalbard, it was actually not to fish. It was for seal hunting or for for uh, polar bears, fox, uh, wintering there and so on. So, so I guess that's the right uh, yeah. observation. I would like to comment on your presentation about the, it goes with this definition of literature as inside the space or inside the language. Um, and I don't, I will not talk about the case of Inuit literature, but not the project on Quebec literature that we had. And we had the same issue that you're, you're dealing with. And we actually find out that uh, literature concept in some cases, and it was the, the case of uh, literature québécoise, is too linked to language to separate it. So we had to find an issue because we wanted to talk about all what was happening on the territory, even if it's not a country, and to see this, uh, how to keep this idea that this literature was extremely linked to language. And actually, that's why the, we came with this title, The History of uh, Literally Life, and not The History of Literature. So inside the literary life of Quebec, there's a literature called Literature Québécoise, which is in French, and and sometimes other languages that are mixed. And then Literature Inou, and then literature written in English, because it doesn't belong to Quebec literature. It belongs to the rest of North America, in this case. It's, uh, and uh, uh, literature uh, written in Italian or Yiddish, that were always, also part of this. So in uh, the history of... Uh, uh, literary institution, of course, you know that some genre disappear, some appear, uh, and literature also appear and disappear, uh, the concept of it. So and it, it was the same discussion that we had. And is it because if you consider, and it's more um, delicate in case of indigenous literature, of course, if you say that uh, Sami literature is Finnish literature, it's a, fine of, a form of cultural appropriation, of course. So you, are, you have to find a distance and to recognize that on Finnish territory it exists other literature than Finnish literature. So it's a very delicate question, but it's a very important one when you have different languages. Uh, but in some cases we talk about like Inu literature for uh, indigenous, but we will not talk about Italian literature of Quebec, of course. It, it belongs to another uh, group that is elsewhere and it's exile uh, literature in this case. But it's very, uh, I think, uh, interesting to see it this way. I see that, Johan, you tell me that we have um, actually the camera has uh, some minutes uh, left only. Probably seven or something like that. <laughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Will, that's, uh, and well, I'm not that's to go, but is there the any last question or comment? And then we will have uh, to close the, uh, the workshop. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to ask about the Sami literature and how, and especially like oral histories that nowadays are written down, are they going to be also considered as the part of Finnish literature in that case and everything that was inspired by Samis? Are, is it going to, like, how do you think you can um, kind of put off all of those different things in a Finnish box if you know not everyone from the Samis I mean wants to be uh, seen as a Finnish more, more like Sami yes thank you this is very good question and and I want to emphasize that in our project we are not creating identity groupings in any strong sense and and we are not referring with the word Finnish to something national or uh, we are talking about Finland's literature in a very broad and inclusive sense and, and we have to say something about Sami literature even if we consider that it is a separate literature but it would be very exclusive also to not to say anything about Sami literature when we are writing Finland's literature because those Sami writers that write in Finland are citizens of Finland 
and it would be very curious to leave them out when we still include some migrant writers that are not citizens of Finland. That I want to emphasize that this is not any essentialist approach that we are adopting. We are describing and we think that there are very separate phenomena that still resemble each other and are historically connected to each other. Like we have family that has adopted members and Uh, different kind of members, uh, but they are still a family, even if they have different backgrounds or genetics, or how do you want to use these metaphors? But but we are not, uh, we don't want to appropriate culturally anything, but we don't want to exclude. And our our mm, method is to describe. We described. We do not define, and that's a huge difference. And, and when, once we have this historical emphasis, it makes it easier because we can say that at this point of time, there were these kind of connections between these things. And later on, they were different. I hope that this answered. Yeah, I'm also wondering, um, because there are three languages in Finland, and uh, are you going to be like, working on the... Uh, We will be commenting on all these languages. As we intend to describe, we have to be very careful in how we describe. And we will emphasize the characteristics of its works and phenomena. And that, that is why we have to emphasize also the differences in literatures. Uh, uh, sorry, languages and dialects, and yeah. So we will be very sensitive, but but if, of course it is difficult, and I believe that things are getting outdated very quickly in the area of literary history. We will criticize the previous literary historians, and future literary historians will criticize us for not being sensitive. Men mentioned uh, the fact that there was a lack of a concept of. Uh, Fiction as one of the strong challenge in uh, also writing a history of literature in this uh, very vast area. Can you uh, just uh, uh, explain a little bit more what, what is, does this mean that the uh, this, uh, absence of a concept of fiction? Uh, well, in, in Inuit uh, language, uh, what is um, what is said is true. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's something it's the definition itself of language uh, to to express what is true so felt with someone, but at the same time they have some concept of fiction, but it is also uh, always contextual. For example, they have a way uh, they have a name of a story that it's only uh, someone that come back home and begin to say uh, is they I did I did this today. And then this, a little like we do at home, but we don't have a French concept for it, right? Like you, you say what happened during the day, and then as long as the night would would begin, slowly this discourse becomes what we will call fiction, which is the old tale of the old times that arrive at night. In the mid, uh, you are almost awake and not completely awake, and this is the moment where what we call fiction, what arrives is the, time of the story of the old time. So there's a continuous uh, line between what happened today and what happened in the old time, in, in the way to, to say it. So mm. where does fiction begin? And is it what you know from this period that is there? Uh, I, I recall here of uh, another culture, but it's very similar, Inu culture. And uh, Josephine Bacon, she's a poet, and she, she make a distinction between what she knows and what she lived. And what she knows, it's not what she lived. It's what the culture gave her. Gave her. So she can talk, I live this, but mm. it's her culture that lived it. So you, you see, the genre that we have, fiction, non-fiction, or the other, they don't work. So we have to base ourselves on a mixed uh, way to do it. And I would say that any indigenous work is actually a mix of different genres that we have. And they, they love to play with this mixture of genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well.
perfect. I think we <laughs> ran out of. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, um, everything that is to be said now will be off the record. So, <laughs> but we. Can <laughs> and thank you for.